you won't learn NiPipe. Uh, so one of the things, my goal today is to get you through some concepts of NiPipe and maybe play with a few things. I also want to spend a little bit of time talking about kind of the future of NiPipe because there are a few exciting products being generated right this minute. And so I'll give you a preview of some of those things. So I'm talking for NiPipe, uh, but NiPipe is not just me, and I'll get to that in a second. But a lot of NiPipe kind of stems from uh, this statement, which was in an article that was written in 1945. Professionally, our methods of transmitting and reviewing the results of research are generations old and by now are totally inadequate for their purpose. And I'm sure many of you see all kinds of papers and publications out there and say, hey, I want to do this thing that's in this paper or publication. And some of you will take that, start writing code or trying to get pieces of things to work. And then you'll realize, oh, I don't think there are the dots connecting piece A to piece B here anymore. So you may go and contact the author and try to get hold of scripts, but that's often not in a state that can be used. Many of you here have been using fMRI prep, something that anybody can reuse very, very easily. So how can we get to the state of fMRI prep for almost everything we do in science? And that was what the birth of NiPipe was partly about. Uh, these are some of the main contributors of NiPipe, and although Chris has crossed the boundary into some netherworld, uh, he was one of my co-conspirators in doing a lot of changes that resulted in what the current API is that you use in NiPipe. I still remember he came as a visiting student doing some neurosurgical work, well, in a neurosurgery lab. He wasn't actually doing surgery on anybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but we've spent some time writing what is the current generation. And since then, many people have contributed. So NiPipe is currently funded by an NIH grant. Uh, there, are, there have been 159 direct contributors. But I also want to pay attention to the bottom part of this. This is directly from uh, GitHub. We rely on a lot of open source products as well. And all of their contributions count as well in many ways. So as we build up this ecosystem of things, it's important to acknowledge the kinds of things that you are dependent on in various ways. And one of the people who's contributed not just via code, but in kind of spreading the use of NiPipe is Michael Notter. Uh, and he built not just the NiPipe tutorial, he built the Beginner's Guide to NiPipe, which was the precursor to the NiPipe tutorial. Many of you may have accidentally run into it till a banner appeared very recently which said, a lot of the things in this tutorial are too old to follow. So you might run into errors, so go see the new tutorial. Uh, while we're at it, we will walk through some notebooks. And so if you want to do it hands-on, I will ask you now to open your browser, search for the NiPipe tutorial, should immediately take you there. And in the NiPipe tutorial, in this fourth paragraph over here, there's a link that says binder service. While I talk about things, I want you to click on it, because that's going to take a little bit of time to spin up on different machines. And if you ever meet Michael or don't meet Michael, just thank him for the wonderful work he's done on the tutorials. I think it has made life easy for everyone. And to really learn NiPipe, you should go through the entire tutorials. And for doing so, I would recommend setting aside at least three days. Uh, there is a fair bit of things to cover, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I said, in one hour, I'm not going to be able to tell you everything there is about NiPipe. The other piece to NiPipe is the architecture as it stands right now, and there are three pieces, uh, what we call interfaces, the workflow engine, and execution plugins. And one of the things we noticed early on, and this is true of many kinds of workflows, is you often need different tools to do the thing that you want to get done from the scientific perspective. 
we're not yet at a stage fully across the evolution of imaging techniques, the kinds of analysis we do, to have a single workflow that addresses everyone's needs. So I'll take fMRI prep, addresses a lot of needs. But let's say you wanted to do high-res an analysis with fMRI prep, so sub-millimeter voxels. Some of the tools in there may not work well with that kind of data. So you may want to go in and change some of those pieces in fMRI prep. But this was true of all kinds of things. I started saying my life as a plumber started with smoothing on surfaces, a time at which there did not exist many things that could smooth on surfaces. So I needed to combine free surfer tools as well as SPM tools at that point in time. Uh, and that was difficult. It wasn't straightforward. So we created NiPipe to address the scenario that you want to be able to mix things. You want to be able to use things that are most appropriate for your use case. And then, once you have those things, you want to be able to execute them on various kinds of systems, whether you have an SGE cluster or a SLURM cluster. The word SLURM did not exist in my vocabulary till about five years back. Uh, so things change even in the execution process as well. Clusters change, the way you run things. These days, you have 86 core machines, I think, uh, in a single system with over a terabyte and a half of RAM. So you could do a lot of things even on a single core, single system with multiple cores. But you don't want to keep tweaking your scripts to adjust your environments. And that's the other thing that NiPipe helps with. Finally, the way we think about computation is as a graph. That each element, each node of a graph is an operation or a transform that transforms inputs into some new outputs. It's not a pure pipeline in a shell sense. A shell pipeline can take a set of inputs, but produces typically one output. So the piping system that exists in the shell, while very powerful, does not apply to a lot of these tools we use within the neuroimaging space. Many of our tools don't produce just one output. They produce many different kinds of outputs. And something needs to handle this management of data going from one thing to the other. There have been several things that have been built on top of NiPipe. Uh, so you've already heard about MRI QC and fMRI prep. There's CPAC and Mindboggle. Uh, CPAC is a framework that allows you to generate different kinds of workflows by giving you building blocks of pieces of things. Uh, Mindboggle is a framework that allows you to analyze structural images. It's not functional images. And gives you a representation that's tuned to each individual. Other people have come through and created graphical versions that allow you to connect these things to one another. So this is Tim Van Murek's work, he created giraffe tools, which allows people who don't want to write code to connect boxes. And connecting boxes is OK till you get to complex workflows. Then you have to fit those boxes together. So NiPipe is never a substitute for actually learning what the tools do and what you want to do. So you have to do that first. You have to go there and understand what is the SPM tool that does realignment, or what is the AFNI tool that does realignment, and why should I use one versus the other? And that's a piece of knowledge that's not easy to find. And that's something that you'll have to dig into for your specific use cases. But our key goal was to rule them all. We wanted to take every single tool that was out there and connect them together in a way that we can process any kind of application that's out there. So let me go through these features uh, one by one a little bit. Interfaces. And to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep out of this, go to the NiPipe uh, documentation website, click on documentation. Uh, we now have access, we now provide tools from over 30 packages that, uh, out there. Uh, so most of you are probably very familiar with SPM, AFNI, FSL, FreeSurfer. There's a lot of other tools out there as well. And you can get access to a lot of different tools. One of the things about consistent interfaces is that I could click on any of these. Somebody shout out your favorite command line tool. Hopefully it's here. Nobody has a favorite command line tool? <laughs> So 
So every tool in NiPipe takes the same form. It has inputs and it has outputs. So you can import the tool by itself. You can set inputs in a variety of different ways, but this is one of the ways. Uh, you can look at the command line that it will generate, and then you can run it. But if you do this, yes, you get uniform access, whether it's a MATLAB SPM tool, or a Java-based tool, uh, or a command line executable. Actually, this is a shell script that wraps around a command line executable. All of them you can address in exactly the same way. Each tool has inputs and named outputs. And that's the other side of NiPipe which is important, the named outputs. So m most of the time when you use these things, the tool tells you I will generate X, Y, and Z. But it doesn't necessarily tell you what I will get given a set of inputs. So a lot of the effort behind NiPipe has been in wrapping these interfaces to know what's going to get produced when you give a set of out inputs. And based on that, we decorate these inputs. We'll tell you what's mandatory and what's optional. We'll tell you what type of things are needed for each kind of input. And it will check when it runs that you're providing the right types of things, which is not often the case when you run some of these command line tools. You learn from it. You put in a string when it should have been a number, and it'll complain. And then you find out, oh, I need to put in a string. And that's the same case over here. It's just more explicit. And in many cases, the underlying command line tools don't complain in a way you can read and understand those things. Okay. Function node. Uh, since NiPipe is written in Python, you have access to Python. And so you can write Python functions that can act as interfaces or nodes in the workflows, which means you can literally do anything on the planet almost. How many people know of if this then that? Oh, a few hands. It's a web service that allows people to trigger all kinds of things. So if you wanted to have Grubhub order you something, you could use if this then that in a NiPipe node while you're waiting for FreeSurfer to finish running for five hours and get you some food. Uh, it's possible. But the power of a, NiPipe, of a Python function is that, is that you can code it to do almost anything. So if you don't have your favorite interface that's already encoded in NiPipe, Yes, you can contribute to NiPipe with a formal interface, but you can also use it through this function node. Uh, sorry. Workflow. So you saw the bet example right over here. Uh, and I'm giving it names of files. If you think of a workflow, the only names of files that you kind of need are the input files. If the rest, you have to do a lot of management when you write shell scripts or MATLAB scripts to do so. The workflow engine of NiPipe kind of takes that out of your hands a little bit because you're connecting things. So let me go to Giraffe Tools and give an example here. Uh, You're connecting pipes between inputs and outputs of things. That's what NiPipe does. And you don't have to say what out file should be named what, and how it should feed into the next node. You just connect them together. And we'll look at this syntax in a second. But that's the idea, that you let NiPipe handle how information flows from one unit of processing to another. And this is not a crazy thing, but typically almost every kind of processing you do is not a line of things. It's not a linear function. It's a graph. Uh, yes, there'll be segments of the graph that are linear in nature. But in many cases, it, it's a graph. And NiPipe handles this through what we call a directed acyclic graph. The semantics part we'll get to when we look at some code. Uh, in many cases, you want to run your workflows over many subjects. In some cases, you want to sweep through parameters. 
And the data management under the hood becomes quite complex when you want to do those things. And NiPipe tries to take care of that through some very simple semantics called iterables and map nodes. Simple may be a relative term, but it does have a fair bit of complexity that it packs into a little bit of semantics. You, a node in a NiPipe graph can itself be a workflow. So you can have nested workflows that can be constructed by combining other nodes. And I'll give an example of one of those workflows in a bit. And plugins, I mentioned how you can take the same NiPipe thing and execute it. It has some constraints. You have to have the files that you're operating on available wherever you're going. So you could use tools like DataLad and others to do so. And anytime you, I say the word DataLad, just look at Adina and ask her to give you a demonstration and teach you how to use DataLad. <laughs> Monday, <laughs> she will teach DataLad. Uh, but that would allow you to take some of these things wherever you're running your workflows. But you can use the same workflow to run on your computer. You can take it to your cluster. You can take it to the cloud. And if your cluster switches from SunGrid Engine to Slurm, you can switch it from SunGrid Engine to Slurm and run it. So that's a fair bit of power without changing a whole lot of code. And it does adapt to many HPC cluster situations. How many here use a compute cluster? Okay, a fair number of you. You have different options that you have to specify often when you use clusters. There's certain queues with GPUs on them. Certain queues have certain numbers of cores available. Certain clusters. How many here use TAC, T-A-C-C? Okay, a couple of people. In TAC, you get a machine with lots of cores and lots of ramps. You can't ask, submit jobs on the fly. Uh, so there are different kinds of options that have, are available on different clusters, and you can use NiPipe to take care of many of those cluster situations. Okay. So I'll briefly talk about NiPipe 2.0, and then we will go on to the binder service. Has the binder service launched? Okay. Uh, for those who are using that public binder service, just keep the following in mind. It will close itself in an hour, independent of what you do. Right? It's perfect for tutorials. After one hour, you should go out and take a walk <laughs> while it restarts. So take it in chunks. Uh, here, we won't have even an hour, so we'll go through some of it. So Pydra. Pydra is the next engine for NiPipe. One of the things that we found was that many people accidentally stumbled into NiPipe and said, we can use this for other domains. But it said, ne said neuroimaging on it. So we thought it was all for neuroimaging. But the underlying engine can literally be used for all kinds of things. So we abstracted that out, improved the semantics, and if you're interested, I'll walk you through a bit of that at the end of the lesson. Test Kraken uh, is for what we call vibration testing. The idea that your workflow, you want to see how it works across different operating systems, uh, different algorithms, different parameters of things. And Test Kraken kind of wraps that up in a nice spec and allows you to do that. NeuroDocker, how many people here have heard of NeuroDocker? All right few hands. How many people use it? Okay, fewer hands. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a tool that makes creating the Docker environments, and you studied Docker through this week, much easier. Uh, and if you start using it, you'll see that you don't ever install anything on your computer other than Docker. And the one advantage of doing something like that is that if you move your computers to other Domains. You can move that container along with you. You never lose the environment you are working on. Whereas, how many people have had to reinstall everything in a computer? Quite a few. Uh, you, you guys must love doing that, right? <laughs> so, take advantage of some of these things. And I'm not saying Docker is a panacea for everything, but these days, almost Everything that runs inside a Docker container pretty much runs at the same speed as outside it. So it's, it's not like the old virtual machines which were all simulated and things would take forever to run. Even virtual machines run pretty much at speed on a modern system. And Nightflows is a new product 
that, that is trying to say, we want to wrap all these principles into a single distributable thing. And it's inspired by things like fMRI prep and MRI QC and other bids apps, which says, you can put things together. It's an application that others can reuse. But we want you to put it in, in a systematic manner with tests, with data, so that others know when things will break and the environment in which it runs. And if you're writing Python code, Nyflows has some support for kind of distributing code that's written in your lab under your lab namespace. So when other people want to import that Python code, they can say, from this org, this lab, this project, import this workflow. All right, let's jump to Binder. Where is Binder? Okay. You should have this if you've run through and launched Binder. And I'm going to click on this index.ipynb. And just hit Run. And it'll turn it into the same page that we saw on Michael's uh, website. It's, Michael's website is a static version of this Binder repo. And the usual one I typically walk through is NiPy Quick Start, the non-neuroimaging example. Because if you're not a neuroimager or you don't do fMRI, it might actually help you get the con concepts behind NiPy easily, as opposed to those who understand the actual interfaces being used. But before I start with that, you can go through different kinds of tutorials on this. So the introduction kind of covers a wide range of things. Uh, and then you can go through all the basic concepts of interfaces, nodes, workflows. And one of the reasons I said this is not going to be done in an hour is each one of these walks you through different elements of things, including when things crash, when, things, when errors happen. And if anything, that's what you want to do. You want to make mistakes and try to fix them. Okay. But today we'll do this quick start example. Hey, you've seen that. So I'm also assuming to a certain extent that most of you are at least familiar with Python, if not proficient at it in many cases. You've seen at least many elements of Python code over the week. And this will be boring for those of you who already know NiPipe. This is kind of elementary things. So just bear with me as I go through this. So we, and you've been used to, I'm assuming also at this point in time that everybody knows how to use a Jupyter Notebook. Okay, fair enough assumption? Okay. So we import workflow node and function, which are classes. And this is an example which I could have asked to make coffee, but that would take some time. I'm instead just asking that function to add two numbers. And I give the workflow a name, and that's important. In the context of NiPipe, every object and node needs a name. Because when you ship off an object to a remote cluster, the variable name does not mean anything. It's what's contained in the object that you can refer to that thing by. So whenever we name things, whenever we use things, we give it a name. So here the workflow has a name, and here we are wrapping this function interface in a node and giving it a name. We're calling it A plus B. We could have called it adder too. So the reason I want to create that distinction is that the name of the variable and the name of the node are two distinct things. This is a Python object that lives in memory in the session that you're running. This name is forever attached to whatever that object in memory is, independent of where it's running. Okay. So this function now, we wrap in a function interface. We tell it, hey, uh, it needs two inputs, A and B, and we'll give it an output name called sum. We now attach this function to it, this function sum over here, wrap it in a node, give it a name, and we call it adder. We now 
set inputs on it, added dot inputs, dot A, equal to one, three, we add the node to the workflow, we tell it to work in the current directory, because if you don't tell it where to work, it will run it in a temporary directory somewhere. And most of the time you want to know where your workflow runs. And then we run it. So let's run that. And NiPipe will give you some things. It'll tell you it's running a workflow, it's running serially, it's setting up, running, and it finished running. And that the output in this particular case is sum equal to four. We can go and change this. We can call this two, and it will run again, and sum is equal to five. Okay. Running a single function, that function looks a whole lot simpler to run than to package it all in these things. So bear with me for a little bit. So we, now we create a second node. And we do something silly again. Uh, we are just creating a list of two objects, A and B. And it's the same idea over here. We create a function interface. We wrap it in a node, give it a name. But here comes the next step. In the graphical interface, uh, where was it? You saw these lines that can be connected. Let me just connect an arbitrary line to an arbitrary output. You're connecting lines, right? That's the exact same thing that you're doing over here with this connect statement. You're basically saying, I'm going to take that sum output of that adder node and connect it to the concatter out, the A input of the concatter node. But concatter takes two inputs, right? We've only connected one thing to the concatter node. So now we give it the second input, B equal to three, and we can run it. And it gives an error. It says, duplicate node name concat a b found. So let's go back. Let's run this. And it said duplicate node found because I had already run this and I tried to add the same named node again to the same workflow. So you cannot add the same named node. Names are important, first class citizens of these objects. Okay. So now we can check the outputs. And yes, we have concatenated two things. Let's add another one. Now we're going to add one to some input that's coming in. And we take the output of concatter, which is some list, and send it to this input A. What do you think is going to happen? I'm going to not, all of you have computers in front of you that's running this, but uh, I'm adding a single number to a list. Does Python like that? If it's a NumPy array, that would be different. But Python doesn't allow adding scalars to lists. So it will run, it will run, and then say, can only concatenate list, not int to list. So that's just a Python error that comes out at the end of the day. One of the things that you learn as you use NiPipe is, how do I decipher the error that it generates when I run into an error? And sometimes those errors are going to be errors that come out of FreeSurfer and FSL, and they could get as cryptic as it gets. And sometimes it'll come out of Python, and my favorite one is list index out of range, and it gets as cryptic as it gets. <laughs> That's something that you'll have to learn over time, how to debug those things. Uh, and it, dependent on every workflow and pipeline. And NiPipe offers something called NiPipe CLI, a command line interface. So if you run a NiPipe workflow and it crashes, it puts out a crash file. And you can take the CLI and say, just run this crash file and it'll drop you into a Python debugger or an IPython debugger and you can see exactly what the error caused it. Okay, so I will do that right this minute. 
So th there is a single crash file in here. I'm not going to run it again because otherwise it'll generate a secondary ca crash file. And it tells me this is the node inputs and this was the traceback. Okay. So now I introduce the concept of map node. I need to iterate over that list. I want to add one to each element of that list. And map node, unlike node, takes an input and says, for so many things, I'm going to run the same operation. And you can specify in map node through this thing called iter field which variable you want to iterate over. And there are more complex forms of this, but let's take this simple example and say, now I want to oper iterate over this variable A. So let's create this workflow and take a look at it. So we have this workflow, we have the adder, we have the concatter, and then we add this plus one thing, but this plus one thing is now a map node, not just a regular node. And when it's done, we can look at the outputs, and it did the right thing. It added one to each of the elements at the end without crashing. Okay, so that's one way of, yes? Ah, good question. This is to introduce concepts of NiPy through a simple function. If that was a, such a simple function, you would rewrite the function. You would not use a map node. Because I can simply do np.array of the input, add one to it, turn it back to a list, send it back out. But in many cases, these things may be lists of subjects or other types of lists that's not a simple operation. Yes, sir. This one? Yeah. Okay. So EG is the output of the workflow.run thing. And EG stands not for example in this particular case, but execution graph. So the execution graph is a list of nodes. And so I, this thing returns that list of nodes. So let's take a look at that. So it has the map node, the concat node, and the <coughs> other map node. Why did I have two map nodes? Hold on one second. <coughs> I must have called it something. Uh, No, that's the name of the workflow. Hello map node is the name of the workflow. I was wondering why I had two map nodes in a single map node workflow. So hello map node is the workflow. That's the name of the node. Those are the names of the other nodes. So those are the nodes. And two is zero, one, two. So it's the last one. And then every, so let's take a look at that. Python 3 needs this to be turned into a list, and wait. And that's a result object. So a result object, let me store that into something else. Since we love foo, has a few things uh, that it captures for every single uh, operation that's run. Inputs, outputs, some provenance, some runtime. Uh, for example, if I look at runtime, it tells me where it ran, captures all the environment variables, duration of running, etc. And here, I'm just giving it the outputs, which is a subset. That helps? OK. All right, so we've done a for loop with map node. And while here I did a map node on just a single list, you can do synchronized map nodes. So you, if you have multiple elements that you want to iterate in pairs, 
you can have iter fields A and B, for example, as two inputs. And that would allow you to iterate in pairs over something. So the semantics of MapNode allows you to do all kinds of paired iterations. But one of the key elements of MapNode over here is that it's a dynamic process. It takes whatever input is coming in at the output of some other thing and iterates over it. So map nodes only work in dynamic mode. The next thing that I'm going to talk about iterables works before you create the graph or run it. It expands out the inputs as multiple copies of the graph or subsets of the graph. So here's an example for the adder. I set iterables. And let's take a look at what it did. Okay. And the easiest way to do this is to look at what our workflow looks like. It's a very simple workflow, right? One, two, three steps. We add A and B, we concatenate, and we add one. What I did over here with iterables is I said the input right at the top in the adder now takes two inputs, one and two. And I want to iterate the entire graph over both of those inputs. So this is a simple uh, graph, but we can take a look at this graph in detail. So this tells me what actually executed. And now you can see the workflow. This is just structured one. They're kind of in parallel over here, because it ran the graph over two inputs set to iterables. This is where it gets fun and complex. And I'll give a neuroimaging example in a second for people who are thinking, why would we ever do this? <laughs> so now I'm going to add iterables to the second node of the graph, the concatter. And I run it. Yes, this is a tutorial. It's a cooking show. It runs. So what I've essentially done is I've written a for loop around the graph at the top level, and then a for loop in the second node of the graph for the second function. So let's take an example. You're running subjects. You want to map or extract time series from different atlases. So your outer loop is over subjects. Your inner loop is over some set of atlases. Whichever node in the graph is the place where you were extracting time series from atlases, you stick in iterables. And you say, I want to do it over these atlases. And your whole graph, you stick an iterable wherever it's reading data for your subjects. And that's going to run over every subject. But this principle holds for sticking iterables anywhere in the graph. So if you wanted to smooth data with five different kernels before you got to extracting time series, you would stick in iterables on the smoothing node. Uh, so it's a very powerful mechanism. And now think of all the data manipulation you would have had to do if you were doing this in a shell script or a MATLAB script or even a Python script. This is now handled internally through the data flow framework and it, because it's piping data from one node to the other. Okay. So just as we can split, so here we have, we have two graphs. And within the graphs, we have two branches because we added iterables at a second level. We may also want to merge this back together. So the final concept in the workflow is a merge node or a join node. I shouldn't say a merge node. It's a node that performs a merge. We call it a join node. And we'll have it do something. And in this particular case, I am importing NumPy. And that's important. Because we get these functions to execute everywhere, it does not know where these other functions live. So if you had put this import NumPy as NP outside, it would have imported it within the context of the script that you're running. But when it sends this to a cluster remotely, it would find it very hard to get at what was executed. All that being said, there is a new library out there which we haven't incorporated into NiPy called Cloud Pickle. And Cloud Pickle 
is designed to solve this problem where it will pickle things with local objects and send it over remote places and recreate things. So here we connect join node, we run it, runs provides the output, and let's take a look. And it gives us the scale data as we expect because we wrote it correctly in this particular case. But the simple graph has just another node. Nothing has changed in the simple graph. But now if you look at the detailed graph, what we are doing is we're splitting as we were doing earlier, but now we are combining two elements back together with the join node. An example, going back to the, I have two atlases extracting time series. I may want to join them back and give me back things per subject with time series extracted from two different sets of parcels. So that's an example of this join node. I mentioned plugins, and one of the things we can do is to run something with two processors. So we run this workflow, and you'll see a word show up over here quite a bit, cached. So one of the advantages of Nightpipe is as it runs these nodes, it caches them in the working directory. So if it receives a, a command to run the same thing that it was doing on the same set of inputs, it won't run it again. It will just pull it out from the cache. Again, you could encode this, but imagine how large your shell script is going to be if you start caching everything. You have a, so when I say I'm a plumber, that's what we do. We're kind of seamlessly taking out things that you don't have to do and doing the plumbing under the hood and giving you some semantics to run it with. So now I can set the base DRR to a different location. And because, yes? Just having a, what, what's the intuition of what workflow.run is doing? That's like, like it's not running in this Python kernel, for example, right? It is. It is. OK, so what's, what's, what is it, when you talk about like sending off to a cluster or something like that, what, what does it do that's, like, how is it related to the OS and the, you know, outside of this? So in this particular scenario, when you say workflow.run, it's just calling shell command. Well, in this case, it's just Python commands. It's just executing in a Python kernel. But if you were to run Chris's favorite function, bet, which is a shell command, it will call out to the shell in a particular location, give it the inputs that it needs, collect the outputs, create a result file, and come back to the workflow. So that's what's happening deep under the hood. And then the workflow goes through each of the steps in a graph in, in the appropriate order, triggering off the next set of steps as necessary and gets everything back at the end. If you, let's say, were to take this to a cluster that has Slurm or SGE, so instead of multiproc, you would have said Slurm over there. And what it would have done is for every job that it's running, it would make a Slurm submit command, an spatch command, which will go off to the scheduler the main thread would just sit and wait for that job to finish. And it would check periodically, it has the job finished, and once it's finished, it would trigger the next set of jobs that were dependent on the output of that job. In this case, it's just running locally inside the Python kernel. So since I changed the location of the base directory, it had to run everything again. It can't find the cache. And still running. And it's completed. And again, without changing the base directory, if I do this, it says everything is cached. I get the results out. So now imagine most of you probably have run FreeSurfer at some point in time. It takes a while to run. Right. If it caches the output of FreeSurfer when it runs within the workflow, the next time you run the workflow, it's just going to pull in the results of the output of FreeSurfer. Nothing that NiPipe does is something that you could not have done 
in a regular other shell script or Python or command. It just takes care of a lot of the plumbing underneath to manage the data that's going on along. You can use multiprocessing on your own to run things in parallel. You can use Slurm on your own to run things in parallel. This just handles that under the hood knowing that the graph that you're executing is an object on which it's operating on. So I'm not going to ask you to do the exercises right this minute because this wasn't the intent of this tutorial to have you do every single exercise over here. But the tutorials are online and you can go and do each one of them. And if you feel like, you can hit Show Solution, and it'll tell you how to uh, solve this. What I do want to ask is, are there people over here who want to see a little snippet of PyDRA? If not, I will take, so if there's a small subset, I'll do it separately. OK, there's a small subset. I'll do separately. I'll take any questions about NiPipe at this point, and yes. Yes, so there is a slight shortcut where you can list, have a list of imports as a list of strings that you can send to the function node to help at least the boilerplate of that question. But fundamentally, it boils down to how Python works. So how does Python work? Python and MATLAB, for those of you who are much more familiar with MATLAB, work on the same principle that there are things available at some location in the system, right? Site packages for Python. And in MATLAB, it's whatever you have in the path for MATLAB, the MATLAB path. So when you import something, what Python is doing is looking up where that is to get that. Okay. When it gets a function, and I've imported the object, import numpy as np outside the function, it has a pointer to an object in memory now. If I send that pointer out, with that function to a different process which does not have a shared memory or a clustered object, it cannot find it. And that's why it has to be important inside. Okay. Are there other questions? Okay, let me. Uh, yes. What would you say? One of the things when, I've, when I use the iPad, I find myself typically stuck on. It's usually kind of difficult to inspect the inputs and outputs of each of the nodes um, in a way that makes sense without having to do like a minimal work, for example, using not brain data. Um, what would you say, like, whenever you're building MacBook scripts for your analysis, how do you typically go about just sort of monkeying with the script and figuring out like what a node actually is outputting versus what you think it should be outputting? Like, is there a way to really quickly inspect? There is, because everything is inside that working directory. So you can go into that node's directory, and there's a file that is the node file. So just like we can do crash inspections, you can do node inspections. Uh, the crash file or the report, so there's an underscore report that's generated in every directory that tells you what the node took in and what it produced. So there's a fair bit of information that's generated in that node's working directory that you can use to inspect. But that's a good question, and I'm going to pull up uh, a sub-workflow of fMRI prep. So as it says, it's a reorient workflow. And just like we're using NiPipe interfaces as building blocks, as you get better at it, you can create sub-workflows as building blocks. And then, so you can, from a programming perspective, debug things at whichever level you are hitting the problem, want to know what's going on. So the functional encapsulation is up to you as the designer of a workflow. Uh, yes, it's easy to attach everything, but it might be better if I were to encapsulate a sub-piece of the workflow because it's going to be a reusable thing that I use across other different workflows. And that's what Nye Workflows has been doing. So uh, Chris and Oscar have been, and the other Chris who will come 
who you will see next week, uh, have been designing these workflows as reusable elements that can be reused for different kinds of things. Uh, but every node in this workflow has its own inputs and outputs. In NiPy, the key difference between a node and an interface is that a node runs in an isolated working directory. An interface runs as if you were calling that command in your shell. So it, it behaves like the underlying command. And that can have problems in certain places. So I don't know how many of you use SPM, but those who do know that when you run SPM .real, SPM's realign function, it overrides the input file. That means it's changing the input that it's operating on. And that could be useful in a certain practical setting, but not in the context of a workflow. So the node object knows that it, SPM does that because the SPM interface has been uh, annotated with special metadata to say, this thing overrides the input object. So when NiPipe's node runs, it copies the object over instead of just pointing to the original object. So those are the kinds of bells and whistles that it implements under the hood to ensure that you don't have to rerun it. Because if you have an input object and you have a function that's running on it, you have to check that the inputs have not changed. And the way we do that is through a function, it's something called hashing. So you hash the object. But if the content of this changes, the hash changes. And it will rerun. So if you were running the SPM without this node thing, it would rerun every single time because it will think something has changed in the input side. So those are some of the things it takes care of. But every object runs in its own directory, has a list of inputs and outputs, and will work through it. I think I'm supposed to be done now, right, Tal? I do? I can. Huh. All right. We can go through other pieces of night five. That's not. So let me ask. Uh, How many people here are not familiar with imaging? OK. All right. So I hope you can follow with this as we go along. But this is kind of the imaging side of this. Uh, quick start workflow. So we're going to use this to see how quickly you can type. You can always hit the show solution button. <laughs> okay. So we'll step through this. It imports a few things. You can ignore deprecation warnings from scikit-learn. So what we want to do is, it's pulled in a file. So since this container also has some data installed in it. So we have a T1 image, and we want to run Chris's favorite command on it, bet, which comes from FSL, takes the image, and strips it. How might you go about doing this? There's more than one way. <laughs> what would you have done <laughs> if you're familiar with FSL? Possibly that. Okay. But I'm going to force you out of that habit. We'll try to do it the NiPipe way. 
So where would you go to look up what you need to do, or what would you do over here? What's the first thing you need to do? One of the things we've already done is imported bet. So bet is in the name namespace. Okay. Well, hey, we can get help. Uh, so, for every interface in NiPy, you can attach .help, and it will tell you exactly what's there on the website. So now it tells me, oh, I can set some inputs. I'm lazy. I'm going to copy. And I will cheat. And as I cheated, I realized that it runs, gives a result. Let's see if my solution looks similar. Somewhat. I've just added a different parameter to that solution, the frac parameter. Uh, But since we are at this, there are other ways I could have set these inputs. So inputs is a structure which has these named things. And you can do things like why are you not working? There's a new bug over here. Huh. If anybody's on the NiPy we website, you can send an inputs don't tap complete. But I will file that bug <laughs> later on. Technically, you should be able to look at the inputs. Uh, we can look at it here. And it tells you all the inputs. And you can see one of the things that it says, undefined. That's a special thing. It says, I don't know what this input is. I'm going to use the underlying defaults of the program. Because everything does not need to be specified. Now let's say, in addition to, so let's take a look at the output. Uh, because I, I'll run it again. We can plot this output. And this is why you need better skull stripping programs. So I'll just show you a couple of other ways in which one can set run this command. So instead of setting inputs there, I could have also set in a more Pythonic way input file. Right. So there are many ways of representing inputs in NiPipe. I could also update this 
It's a dictionary, so I can give it a dictionary. So NiPy follows Python in many, many places. You can do various things uh, just as you would have done in Python. But sometimes the structure of just writing simply inputs dot thing while it's a little verbose can be quite nice because you can just simply comment out an input if you wanted to change it, etc. Okay. So let's do the next step, which is we've also imported this. Oh, actually, this may not have been imported. Let's see. No, it's imported. It's there. We will uh, do this exercise. Let's see. Import isotropic smooth from nightpipe.interfaces.fsl and find out the FSL command that is being run. That green button is super tempting. We have to have something. <laughs> Somebody help me here. Uh, so the I'm actually looking for some Python Python help. So this will give me the help. But what I don't understand is why printing a property returns the property object. <laughs> yes? So these are all the op properties of uh, the various properties and functions of that object and something in this notebook is not printing properties <laughs> so if I said this equal to true it'll do the right thing but when I print the property it's not printing We'll figure this out later, but something in this notebook is not sh doing what it should do. So what the dot command should have done is printed FSL mats. No. The whole point of a property is to hide that variable away. <laughs> so, but if I say this is equal to FSL mats. Okay. Okay, so so when we look at help, which we can, it'll tell me it's running FSL math. Mats. 
it wraps that command. So now the second piece of this is to actually run this with a smoothing kernel of four millimeters. I can look up what the inputs are. It says there are three mandatory inputs, a full width half maximum, a sigma, and in file. So for smoothing, you would either use full width half maximum or the sigma. And NiPipe encodes this by telling you that it's mutually exclusive. So you wouldn't be able to put both of these terms when you use it. Okay. So they're both in millimeters because they actually translate to one another, but they're two different ways of representing smoothing kernel. They are not identical. So one of the things you would need to do is to determine what you want to use. So you can do smoother.inputs. Let's go with full width half maximum to four. It'll also need the input file. And we can look up what the name is. It's in file. And before we run it, one of the things we can do is look at the command line. So whenever you set inputs on NiPipe, you can, for command line executables like this, you can look at the command line that would have been launched. And if you run this in a node, this command line would also be listed alongside the result outputs, the result that you would have. And now we can look at the result. Okay. While, while it's computing, one of the things you can notice is that I set the full width half maximum to four millimeters. And in the command line, you can see the dash S because FSL maths does not actually take inputs in full width half maximum. It takes it in sigma. So internally, NiPipe converts it to a sigma and puts it in there uh, as the sigma parameter. Okay, let's see. I did not set the output file, but let's look at where the output is. And instead of using the specific thing, I can use the variable. So I can go res.outputs. Out file. And it's a slightly smoothed brain, which is what we would expect. Okay. So now we transition from just using an interface to using a node. In the examples I showed earlier, we were wrapping function node. In this, and I said the function is the interface. So here, we want to use bet. So we wrap bet, and we give it a name, and we assign it to a variable. Or let's keep it simple. Now we can set inputs on it.
actually, let's look up what the inputs are. And we will do an additional thing, which is generate a mask, which is a Boolean. It's an optional input. Let's look at the solution. We're not doing anything else. We're not running things. It's just creating a node. Ah, it wanted masks to be true. It didn't tell me in my instructions. Okay. We'll do the same thing for the smooth node. this particular workflow, it wants to do one more thing, take the mask and apply it to the smoothed output so that we can get a smooth brain that comes out. So there are two mandatory things, the mask file and an input file. So we create a workflow, call it my first workflow. And the first thing we need to do is to take the bet node and let's stop that. Call it bet, and my other node is smooth node and mask node. So we can connect bet mask file to smooth no to my mask node. Mask file. Connect mask node, sorry, smooth node and since I don't know what the output is I have to go look up smooth node dot help and it's called out file. Also to my mask, connect that to my mask node and call it the in file. I can set the base directory to my current working directory and I can call run. Is this going to run? Any ideas? Is it going to run?
So there are a few things I needed. I needed to actually set an input to bet to run things. And then I needed to count, take the output of bet and plug it to smooth. Or I could have set the inputs of smooth file, in which case I will comment this out. So I can do one of two things. I can take the output of bet and give it to smooth in this particular case. This is not a realistic workflow. It's just an example of extracting out the brain that's smooth from uh, using the brain mask that comes out of bet. And since I can smooth in two different ways, I can smooth the stripped brain, or I could have smoothed the brain as a whole. And whether you do that or not is dependent on your use case and your application. Right? And in one case, you would connect the output of bet, the out file, to the input of smooth. And in the other case, you would say, I'm just going to smooth the original input that I'm given. And let's see what Michael wanted us to do. So we created a workflow, set the output DIR to a different location, that's OK. Connected the mask file to another mask file. Connected the out file also to the mask node in file. For the smooth node, he did set the input file to the original input file. Okay. Okay. So we can run this. Uh. Ah, and I have an error. Right. It says isotropic smooth requires a value. I defined my node, my isotropic smooth node, without giving it an input value. Okay, so let's give it an input value. And I can run it again. And now it'll do the smoothing. and the masking, and it finishes. Okay. And you'll notice right over here it said found cached. Right? Because I ran it, it crashed when it could not find the full width half maximum. But it did run it. It did not go all, it did not t give me that error right away. So the next time I ran it, it just pulled it, pulled the bet results out from the cache directory and used it. If I go up here and I change an input to bet, It does not compare the size. It actually compares it bitwise. So if any bit of your input would ha file would have changed. So the question was, if I change the input file, would it pick up? How would it do the comparison? It does a checksum. And it has two ways of doing the checksum. But one of them literally looks at every bit in the file and says, has any bit changed? And if it changed, it will rerun again. So now I'm going to change not the file, but just a parameter. And it's running better, right? So it's because it says 
you have changed some input for this node, I need to run it again. And it finished running. And if I now run this whole thing again, every node will pick its result up from its cache. Right? So we should see three cached cache pickups. Found cached, found cached, found cached. So often when you write scripts, that's the kind of data management that does not happen. Or you will say, if this file exists, and you'll use a file name typically, don't do this step. But that file name is not always representative of the contents of the file. Let's say you're running fast, which is a probabilistic segmentation thing. Every time you run it, you'll get a slightly different result. So you want to be able to think about how to think about your workflows when you want to rerun things, when you want it to not run again. Okay, we'll stop there. I think this gives you a flavor of kind of crafting these workflows. The good news right now is there's a lot of workflows out there. If you go look through the code of fMRI prep, you'll get lots of sub workflows that exist. And so you can reuse them. The other thing that this should hopefully help you to do is, if you want to change the code to use something else, now you can step in and say, I want to use this AFNI tool instead of what FMRI prep is using, because I know it aligns this particular data set better. Your goals of a workflow may be different from other people's goals of a workflow. You should not go and reinvent workflows just because you feel like it. It's good for educational purposes. Highly recommend it. Write your own workflow. But for stable workflows, reuse things that have been written by others that you can reuse. But you will come across scenarios, just like my student did with the brainstem, where FMI prep would fail miserably on it because it's not created to deal with brainstem data. So there, you would need to write different workflows to do so. Uh, but now, hopefully, you know how to take existing workflows and tweak it. Because at the end of the day, it's like Lego. You attach blocks together. And once you get used to what those blocks are, it'll be fairly straightforward to attach these things. Okay, I will stop there. Now it's 2.30. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out. Uh, Neurostars, which came back online soon after Chris said you should go to Neurostars. Uh, that's a great place to ask questions. Uh, we are there on Gitter, Gitter Mattermost, Slack, and various other channels. Uh, it's a community that will respond to different kinds of questions. So it could be questions about actual analysis steps or something specific to NiPipe. As I mentioned, uh, we are creating the next generation of things, which should make some pieces even simpler. Uh, than what it is right now, but the basic blocks will still remain the same. You're connecting functions to each other or connecting specific outputs of specific functions to specific inputs of other functions. Some of the folks in the community are working on a search feature which would tell you what nodes may be available to do what you want it to do. Uh, and we see that as twofold. It can be educational. You get to see what's there. You know, there are tools that do similar things, but how do they differ? I mentioned in my uh, talk on Tuesday, the error models that AFNI, FSL, and SPM uses are different. Luckily, right now, there's a paper from Tom Nichols, which you can read to see how they're different. But there are differences across those tools. And that's the kind of knowledge we hope to bring in with taking these interfaces, annotating them with additional semantics, and allowing you to search over those semantics. Uh, so I'm happy to take any questions. If you are a proficient NiPipe workflow, I'm sorry, NiPipe workflow creator, I'm sorry I bored you for the hour, last hour and a half. And hopefully those who haven't seen it got something out of it. Thanks again. <laughs>